Working Interferences is intended for mature audiences. Since the host never grew up, someone needs to be the adult. Welcome to Working Interferences with Josh and Lance, the dental advice podcast for the average dentist. Here is Josh and Lance. Bruz, what is up? It is time for uh, Working Interferences. I am your co-host, host for the weekest, uh, Lance Timmerman, and joined this week subbing for Josh is my brother Clint. How's it going? Uh, you know, after some hiccups, I think we're going okay. I well, think- that, it, this is true. <laughs> <laughs> Tis the season, right? Absolutely. I, I swear if it's not one hardware problem I'm having, it's another. So we've been trying to... I don't want to talk about your hardware. Oh, well. Or your, uh, or your software. <laughs> hey, the people on my OnlyFans like fans account, they do. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, both of them, both, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is just me and my my other my Gmail account. Yeah, or, uh, that that that's all. Little, so all of my only fans are just just me. Little just cross pollination, awesome, right. <laughs> awesome. So, so we're recording. This is early December. Um, are you in the festive spirit? Are you decorating and ready for the 2020 version of Christmas? Well, I'm trying to. It kind of snuck up on me. I guess it always tends to. Uh, at least in adulthood, uh-huh. uh, got a tree just a few days ago. Uh, okay, was gonna cut it down, but uh, ended up just getting one at a lot. Oh, and really? Still have to put some, still have to put some trees up, and then uh, still did Dutch Christmas. Now you you still have yet to illegally cut down a tree, correct? This is true. <laughs> I, I, I've fallen short as far as the uh, Timmerman siblings go because yeah. Shauna did that first, right? Uh huh. At yeah. Rich College. Yeah, and then, and then you followed. I suit followed a few suit years later, and I I couldn't find the horticulture area, so I I cut down a tree next to the science building, and uh, so I got arrested right before finals, um, my freshman year. <laughs> so uh, did they catch you in the act? Not in the act. Um, it was in the disposal. You know, you got to learn how to hide the body better. And my, oh. I, I left it to my roommate, and I went and took a final, and came back, and uh, about forty five minutes later, I went and took a shower. So I was still dripping wet when the police came to our dorm room door, and uh, so we got a little escort. I got to ride the back of the car uh, to the campus police, and um, yeah, a, a couple years later, I went back to visit school, and uh, they never did replace that tree, and so it it, it was a. Blue spruce, and so the, I only took the top half because it was a dorm room. I couldn't use the whole tree, and uh, the the branches kind of started going up like a Joshua tree. So it looked more like a sphere by the time I looked at it, and it was had a had a nice healthy laugh um, <laughs> as I walked by. Nice. <laughs> because you still had to pay for it, though, right? Uh, yeah, it was, did they make you pay him back? It's a long story. I, I I had to pay them or you know give them a tree. So I went when the because when I got in trouble, it was still winter and the, and the, the ground was frozen over. So um, I couldn't, you know, give them a tree until it was spring thaw. And so I found a dig it yourself place uh, and, and went and dug up a tree and, and gave it back, went to the um, the maintenance facility and said, here's your tree and, and walked away. <laughs> Awesome, and they, and they didn't plant it. So, what do you think they did? Just I think they looked at away? the piece of crap that that I gave them and said, "You know what? I think we're better off with the half tree that's still there." <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, haven't you seen the movie Fargo? I I have seen the you, movie Fargo. You, you should have put the tree in in the a wood chipper. <laughs> you know, you can't just put. Well, then again, I guess he still got caught. So, yeah, that's that's the thing is I <laughs> a little past tense, a little too late at that point. Right, right. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I imagine things must be different for you this year because you're in your new apartment. Yeah, well, we still we found a, a tree lot, and actually, I kind of like the tree that we got. It's um, I can't remember what she called the the type of tree it was. It's not a blue spruce, but it uh, as long as we keep it hydrated, the the needles shouldn't dry out, and it's it's got a nice texture to it. So I'm actually kind of kind of liking it. But there's not a lot of room in the apartment for a tree, so true. I'm uh, it's a little cramped, but it's it's like pre- the. the- it's pretty. Yeah, for sure. Are you digging the smell? You know, it doesn't have that much of a smell. 
uh, either that or else my my sinuses are just screwed up from all the years of being a dentist. Uh, there there are certain things I just can't smell very well because I think of all the former Cresol and all the other shit that goes on at the dental office. You sure you don't have the Rona? I might have the Rona. <laughs> Whenever I'm in public, if I ever sneeze, I go, God damn, I can't smell anything. Just to see, look for people's reaction. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. You know, Josh was talking about the tree that he got and how immaculate and wonderful it is. Uh-huh. I think I need to see these things in person because I Google searched it to Google images and I, I can't tell a damn difference between that and any other fake tree. Oh, really? Um, it, it must be nice. I need to check it out. Yeah. Um, I think that'll I'm be not sure if you, that'll be my next oh. purchase when we finally get a, a place that we can really call, call our own. We'll we'll invest in the tree. Have you seen the one the the tree that the friars have up? No. Very very modern looking tree. Oh. At least I'm pretty sure it's them. Wait, it, it, yeah, I did see it. It kind of reminds me of something though that Margot and Todd, the you know the neighbors <laughs> in Christmas, Christmas vacation, vacation would have. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but still, very very nice tree. Yeah. Yeah, for and, sure. And the, the Friars are much more enjoyable company than, than Margot and Todd, I'm sure, too. Probably. There's there's a really good chance. There's a really good chance. I'm <laughs> not entirely sure, but... <laughs> I did have a question. Did you? Ab- about last week's working interference. Oh, really? Okay. I, I'm a little behind, and I was trying to catch up uh, a couple of days ago. Did you, did you or Josh try to pull an Andy Kaufman... Because I went to go play the episode, and then uh, and when I when I refer to Andy Kaufman and at least Jim Carrey's emulation of him, Man in the Moon, uh-huh. because he really wanted it to where there was going to be a a television broadcast that would make it seem like something's wrong with your TV, but there really wasn't. <laughs> and he thought that'd be funny because I went to go play this episode, and nothing's coming through. Nothing's coming through. No, so um, I'm unplugging my phone. I'm adjusting <laughs> everything. I'm like. <laughs> What the fuck is going on? Awesome. For about a good five minutes. Yeah. And then I finally played another app and then realized, oh, there's two uploads. Yeah. So I guess there was one upload of so, what, like an hour of nothing. Yeah, pretty much. So it's it's a karma thing. Um, Alan Mead had, had posted something saying, hey, is anybody else having problems with their Adobe Audition when they're making recordings? And I'm like, no, it works fine for me. Well, that day, Josh had sent me the file and it's in a wave format and to upload you have to do it in mp3 otherwise too big of a file and apparently when i converted the file to mp3 it didn't work and so the the visual aspect of it when you look at the squiggly lines on the the software it looks like there's a file there but it was empty and um so the next morning josh texts and says hey um something screwed up with the the pot the episode so I, I played it and it was empty. And then, it, so I tried to re-upload it. And so I put a little asterisk next to the, the correct file. So if you had the, if your episode had an asterisk next to it, then you knew you had the, the current one, the replacement one. And if you had already downloaded the original, then it didn't have the asterisk and it was, it was empty space. And I was having uh. too many people were saying, no, I still tried to upload it or, or I, I got the asterisk, but it's still empty. So I uploaded a second episode, a second version. And, uh, just figuring the people that had already subscribed would would figure out they'll just get the current one and, and figure it out. But yeah, that was a karma thing. So I had to message Alan saying, "I, I blame you, you asshole," because I it was fine until you mentioned it. So it's like when you tell that patient, "It'll take me five minutes to get this tooth out." Yeah, it's not going to take you fifty. Yeah, just because you jinxed it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, Lance, this is an advice show. Is it? Is it? Is it that we're going to do? Sometimes, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe not. It is. It is. Um, I don't even have the script that Josh usually uh, reads off. You know, where uh, we we answer all your questions from the neat little Facebook groups. We answer questions from Reddit. 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 <laughs> I'll dr- I'll drop it later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, we try to answer the questions that Gordon Christensen cannot answer. Now, Clint, we don't want just any question, do we? No, I don't think so. Okay, good. You're good. Because that's, that's not what we have. So we've got... Um, and and uh, this week, we were, I was requested not to do any Reddits. So... Um, you know, you've got some good ones. So I'm not. So I thought I'd start off with this. Here's this one. Neil writes, I've got a team of 10 women ranging in age from 22 to 60. Any ideas on what I should get them as a gift in addition to the cash I do every year? Last year, it was Birkenstocks. 
So, Clint, what do you think about Christmas gifts? <laughs> did, did, you, did you hear that? What was that? Oh. I heard something. Okay, that was Holly saying vibrators. <laughs> Vi- ah. <laughs> That will put a smile on your staff. So, face, is that huh? something you give your staff? You, want, you get, if you gave your whole staff a vibrator, not one for them all, but one each. Um, I just give them my used vibrators. You just you give them yours. Yeah, they don't know that it's used. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they'll be able I, to tell. I put it in a paper bag. Give it to them. Here you go. <laughs> Could you get in trouble for? Um, is that considered harassment? <laughs> you know, I I would think so, but I, I don't know. You know how there's those rules too of like. If, you, if it's a female boss, can, can, can Aaron Elliott give her staff vibrators? Then it's um, okay. Well, probably probably not. I mean, I guess a sexual device is a sexual well, device, right? Because, uh, I mean, if a female boss gave a vibrator to a male employee, that would just be wrong. And a male boss given to a female employee vibrator. But could a female give a female and a male? That's what I was male? wondering. Kind of like, have you ever had an assistant that tries to pass you, say, like a wood, uh, a wedge, and they'll put it on the bib of the patient, and like, here, pick that up, and you're like, hey, right, right on the woman's breast. Oh, like, really? No, you I... You can have to hand it me a different way. I've never had a, an know, assistant so stupid that they would do that. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, I've had that You've many had a time. But wow. then I know other female dentists, like, well, yeah, I don't mind. I just grow up the woman. I'll, I'll grab whatever from their breast all the time. Right. Like, yeah, that's no man's land. For yeah, me. For, for me, I, I, I stay so. absolutely... <laughs> I mean, I bib up, bib them up as fast as possible, no matter how what they're wearing. Unlike you know, dentists in Marshall, Texas, that prefer zero bibs, <laughs> zero. <right. laughs> Sometimes zero shirts. Yeah, it, it, that's optional. <laughs> um, now you you you're currently without practice. You're you're an employee, so you, you it's a little different of an expectation for you than than in years past when you were a practice owner. When you were own a practice owner, do, were you? Did you give gifts? Did you have a Christmas party and, and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, and, and here's the deal: dentistry's made me kind of just bitter and cynical. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I feel like no matter what I've tried to do, um, I took the staff to this arcade place one time. Uh-huh. Um, I try to get creative with my gifts. Most of the time. Uh, even when I did give cash gift cards, mm-hmm. uh, barely I'd ever get a thank you. But whenever I would, whatever I'd try to do, it always get back to me that, yeah, how about instead of spending money on anything, just give me the cash. Or yeah. if it's going to be cash and an event or cash on, and, you know, I guess in this case, Birkenstocks, just give me the cash. Yeah. So then it just ended up becoming like, fine, you know what? Screw it. It's easier for me to just get a cash gift card. So yeah, here's your cash gift card. Enjoy. We we used to. I mean, yeah, I was like you. I was try, I, when I first graduated. I'm a practice owner. I was all excited for. I want to. I want to be the good boss, and I want to have people talk about me as their boss, so, so that the people will want to be my employee. I'll never have to try mm-hmm. to have to put an ad out there because as soon as there's an opening, someone's going to want to fill that spot. And what I found was, yeah, you go over and above and all this kind of stuff. They really didn't want the party. They didn't really want to go to dinner. They didn't want, and, and they just wanted the money. Yeah. So, so I don't even, for the past several years, we haven't even gone, had dinner. Most people have, were so busy with other things in life that they couldn't carve out a night to go to dinner as a group. So we started just doing lunches. And now it's just, we kind of, uh, the last day before we cut for break. Um, past couple of years, we have taken the week off between Christmas and New Year's. Um, we'll, we'll close office early, go to lunch, and then usually we'll go home. Uh, I think last year we actually went back to work. So, um, and people actually prefer that, you know, they don't mind having lunch. They're going to be there anyway. So it wasn't getting, it wasn't inconveniencing their normal flow and they just wanted the cash. They don't, uh, I've, none of them has, have ever really been that grateful for the gifts that I've ever come up with. So this one, man, you gave everybody Birkenstocks. That's that's really cool. I'll I'll bet you if you didn't already know this, Neil, I'm sure some of the staff talked amongst themselves and wished that you didn't give them the damn Birkenstocks and just would have given the sixty bucks that <laughs> sure. you spent on the Birkenstocks. Now, does the staff know if you take them to Nordstrom's, they'll give you in store credit just straight across? Oh, so really? They could at least turn turn the Birkenstocks into uh, oh. Uh, just a Nord- yeah. Nordstrom's gift card, at least. I had one where uh, I gave them uh, a thoughtful basket for each person. I, you know, I and I I got 
uh, like $150 worth of Jean Juarez massage for each person and um, stuff. I, I, we've, we, Holly and I spent time filling these these baskets for each individual person. Each basket was a little bit different, but for the most part, they had a couple hundred dollars worth of value. Every single one of them took them back to get the cash. Wow. So it was... <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, color me cynical. That's just after yeah. y- years and years of the same thing over, you're like, you know, uh, I'm done with that. So yeah, uh, cynical or realistic? Something. I mean, it's. I mean, th- th- so this one person responded to that question. Says, I found a great deal on coach bags. I got the monogram key ring, and then I'm going to put cash in the purse. I guarantee that that staff is going to take that cash out of that purse <laughs> and go take it the coach bag. And get get cash for the bag. Take it yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they are. <laughs> uh, now, of course, in this case, when you know, you think the boss might be like, you know, expect them to show up with that bag. Like, hey, are you using your bag? Yeah. Or would they just say, well, yes, but it's not a work bag, so yeah. that's why you don't see me at the office with it. I guess they'll probably come up with some sort of excuse. Or, or but- would they play it this way, where they would make sure that they're seen used with a bag a few times, maybe take a few pictures on social media. Hey, look, look at uh, my great bag, and then take it back. Uh huh. Yeah. Because you know the kind of like shit at Nordstrom's is just rentals. You you just take it back, even if you wore it a few times. Exactly. Although some people have. Uh, exploited that system because yeah. i guess if your shoes wear out you can take them back no questions asked and they'll give you a new pair <laughs> but then nordstrom's they would donate them to secondhand stores but then i guess people would just go to the secondhand Wait. stores buy the shoes and for two bucks and then go to nordstrom's and get a new pair uh-huh. <laughs> which again after being a dentist doesn't surprise me at all or could you Wear the shoes, take them there, get them donated to the the thrift store, go buy them from the thrift store and take them back and like circle of life, do it over and over. And just accumulate (laughs) shoes after shoe after shoe. And then you'd be set. Uh Uh-huh. You're like, I bet you could do that. And you could line up. These these are the shoes for the rest of my life. Uh Uh-huh. It'd be like the back of your closet. I I think so. Some Edmund Allen's. Yeah. (laughs) Awesome. (laughs) But uh, no, I, I agree. I'm pretty sure someone's taking a picture of a handbag uh-huh. and then taking it back. Kind of like, for, I don't know if dad does this to you. He gives me a lot of his used clothes. And <laughs> he's like, here you go, son. You know, it might be like a Washington Huskies jacket or something. And yeah. it's very heartfelt. At the same time, it might not be exactly the what I want. So maybe yeah. same thing. I wear it around him a couple of times. Maybe there's a picture. Yeah. And then, and then that's going with the Nordstrom's donations to, to Goodwill. I think you filled a void because I used to get the clothes and then they stopped. And I guess they were started giving to you instead. So. <laughs> is that how you know who the favorite child I is? I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> who gets the hand-me-downs? Pretty much. I used to get used books. Hey, I read all these books. You should. Here you go. I'm like, I don't even fucking like these people, the, the authors. So it's like, oh, great. I mean, I'm talking bags of books. Oh, yeah. Mom recently tried to pawn a bunch of stuff yeah. off. And unfortunately, uh, her, her memory's not what it used to be. Uh, so yeah. every time I see her, it's, do you like Dave Baldacci? I, mean, I, I don't know what that is. Well, I know who he is now because <laughs> yeah, of her. And then she keeps offering me these books. Because I've already so. turned them down. Uh, <laughs> I, I actually read a couple Baldacci books a few times. And finally, I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm kind of done. So now, now I just say, no, I fucking hate that guy. <laughs> And I bet she looks shocked. Uh, a little bit. And then when you see her next time, she'll ask the same question again. Well, she'll, she'll have pawned <laughs> off the book to you. So, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, you know what you should do next no. time she gives you one? Just write, fuck this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and then whoever then gets the book, <laughs> open it up. And like, whoa, I wasn't expecting that. Wow. <laughs> kind, of, I mean, kind of like. Uh, I don't know if Joel listens to this podcast. He should. He shouldn't. Joel Chapel. He's a he's on the snarky okay. dentist. All right. My good buddy Joel. Yeah. Uh, we're at BYU, and you know you could sell your books back. Oh uh, yeah. For yeah. Usually only like a quarter of what you bought them right. for. Right. Uh huh. He'd always draw like you know <laughs> a, a picture of a guy getting a handy or something just obscene, uh-huh. and then sell it back. So <laughs> the next person that buys the physics book is going to open up like, whoa, what the hell? <laughs> Big throbbing veiny one. Uh. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. 
All right. Well, so my, my advice to this person is don't waste your time. <laughs> Just give the cash. Yeah. Yeah. Don't lose sleep over it. Yeah. <laughs> or save the money and just fire him. Or that too. Well, actually, at first, when it's like, I've got a team of 10 women. At first, I'm like, yeah, I need to cut that in half, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Call one from the herd and let the rest of them qu- tremble and quake. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Question number two. Uh, so, Lab says they don't want to do Emacs crowns on molars because they fracture. So, this is Mauricio88 says, can I assume that they're full of shit? Is there a reason why some labs won't do Emacs on posterior teeth? Is it because most dentists under prep, thus giving an inac- inadequate restoration? So lab doesn't want to take responsibility for any blame? Or is Emacs usually more expensive for the lab to make than zirconia, which this lab is big on? For Emacs, I usually do two millimeters occlusal reduction with one to two millimeter chamfer margin with smooth line angles. Emacs can't fracture under those conditions. I did many serrate crayons on molars in a past job and had no issues with fracture. Clay, have you ever heard of a lab refusing to do uh, what you asked them to do? I have not. I think once I was straight out of school, the a lab called and they essentially said, Hey, we'll do what you want. Uh-huh. I think maybe my prep or the impression wasn't great. Uh-huh. Just, we're not going to guarantee this. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's like, usually what I get. Sometimes okay. they'll say, Hey, I think a better material would be this or whatever. So they'll, 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 my labs will always do what I want, but they may question the, my wisdom. Yeah. And I mean, now, a lot of times if they call and say, Hey, I really think this should be, uh-huh. In this case, a PFM because of blah, blah, blah. Uh-huh. Half the time, I'm like, yeah, go for it. For I sure. I trust. I only work with labs that I can trust. And if they say, look, I think this, I'm going to believe them. Uh, I'll, I'll defer yeah. to them. They're the ones that have to that, that see all the different failures and things. I'm wondering if the, this lab is not that they're not full of shit. They, they just don't like your prep, Mauricio 88. <laughs> Right, exactly. (laughs) They're saying you suck. And despite the fact you say I usually do two millimeters occlusal reduction with one to 1.2 millimeter chamfer, fuck, I've never measured my chamfer margin. I just make it look the way it's, I think it should look to my eyes. I've never, have you measured your chamfer? Measured it? No, but I I mean, I can usually eyeball that I've got enough uh, of of a shoulder Uh reduction. And then some people probably are not. Uh, you know, maybe it's almost like they're prepping for gold or something, or just real thin, or maybe they do have yeah. where where the porcelain's going to be uh, thin on a on a shoulder What's or something. Interesting to me is is uh, the more I work with other offices and things, um, I'm big on occlusal reduction burr to make sure mm-hmm. that 100. percent I have a two millimeter reduction. Um, it, it appears most or many others uh, eyeball it. They use their burr maybe on its side, but I I. I'm usually wrong when I try to not use a reduction burr. So yeah, I could see a, I find a, a most lab being lab frustrated. Techs like you more if you get the more reduction you give them, the better. Uh huh. They're they're gonna love you more. And well, what's interesting is is there are so many. I remember instructors at dental school where they were they almost put the fear of God that if you know the the tooth structure is sacred, don't over reduce. Mm-hmm. And and I was always scared to over reduce. But man, you talk to any lab tech and they'll show you the cases that they like. It's it's aggressive preps. So I'm I'm probably Very, a pretty yeah. aggressive prepper because I don't want my lab saying, I mean, I, I still occasionally will get, hey, we need a, a reduction coping for you. Like, okay, great. Uh, sucks to be me. I should have prepped better. Um, I try to rarely get a reduction coping, but sometimes. Yeah. And it happens. And I, I still prefer the reduction coping over the reducing the opposing just because if you haven't told the patient ahead of time, they'll yeah. be like, why are you touching my other tooth? Yeah. So, yeah. How, where did you screw up? Now, I didn't right. know this. <laughs> this person responded, says, because zirconia is more profitable for the lab. I, I guess I don't know how labs work. Um, that was news to me that uh, zirconia is more profitable. Are, are you aware of zirconia being more profitable for a lab? I am not. I mean, I, uh, well, a lot of times they're able to just mill the Emax now, right? I mean, if uh-huh. you're doing it, by hand and you're crafting it, I mean, there's a reason why some people will charge upwards of five, $600 a unit. Uh-huh. But if it's something you're just scanning and milling, is it going to be that much of a difference? Yeah, I don't know. Because you can do Emacs pressed and you can do Emacs milled and, right. and you can do zirconia milled. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know. I, I honestly, I, I haven't had a problem with Emacs. Whenever I've gone Emacs, I, I use my reduction burrs. I, I haven't had a fracture for that reason. But, um, I'm usually if I'm doing Emacs, I'm probably going to be bonding that in place, which is going to increase its strength too. Um. Well, that was another thought I had. Um, I, I'm also now convinced that at least most people I tend to work with, uh, they're just looting Emacs on on a tooth that they didn't want to get them numb, so it's full of saliva and blood. They just put it on there, and it's not going to be as strong as if, say, if you bonded it on there. Uh-huh. Maybe that's contributing to some of the failures that you know Mauricio 88's getting. Yeah. Well, I, what I found is that some people still think they're bonding because they're using a self-etch resin cement. I, I don't think that's a true bond like I get when I'm using my veneer cement, uh, you know, where I'm, right. I, I like the, what is it? Fourth generation. I'm a total etch and then a bonding mm-hmm. agent and cure that. And then put the restoration with the, it's looting resin. Right. Where, yeah, I should be getting a pretty, pretty damn strong bond, you know, 35 newtons or something, but or millipascals. So, we should get Zach Miner on here to tell me how many Newtons I'm really getting. Yes. Or actually, one thing I was going to recommend is uh, I know your friends a lot of lab techs. Get like Phil Reddington on here or something. He's got a nice British accent. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and just kind of ask, you know, from the lab technician's perspective, what what they like, what they don't like, what they think the dentist could do better. Yeah. Throw all the um, dentists under the bus. The, are you a member on Facebook of the Oops Dental Bloopers group? No, <laughs> I, I, I need to be. It's so funny. It's it basically lab techs throwing dentists under the bus. And, and nothing makes you feel like a really good dentist is when you see some really shitty dentistry that some other dentist tried to do and, and pass off. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, I don't feel so bad. <laughs> right. Yeah, I should I'll join that as soon as we're done talking. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a funny, funny group. But uh, I always try to listen to what they say, though, yeah. because, I mean, they – they, this is all they do it all day, every day. So they know better than me. Like, Hey, what could I do better? What would you prefer? Yeah. I, I do here. Um, you know, even just a couple years removed from dental school, Bob Clark, uh-huh. Williams dental lab. Uh, I was even able to just, cause we were, I was doing an immediate bridge. Okay. So I still took an impression and then sent it to him and, and I said, Hey, when he comes back for the final prep, what can I do better? What can I do for you? Uh-huh. So he's like, Oh, do X, Y, Z. We can do this in all Emacs. Yeah. Um, yeah. So to anybody out there, listen to your, your your lab tech is your friend. Listen to their advice. They're not trying to be a holes. Well, what I find is a well, lot of there maybe some many dentists <laughs> they'll, they'll talk about their staff or their team. You know, they've got their hygienist and they've got their front desk and they're but they don't really consider their lab technician as part of their team. And and that's I think a huge mistake because you're only as good as your lab. And you you try to completely agree if you're shitty with you use just shit cheap labs and uh, then that's about as good as you are and uh that's not where you want to cut corners yeah no absolutely completely agree and if you find that the lab that's working better for you uh if they're a little more expensive find a way to put that in your fee you um, put it in your fee and then cut that corner well I, I was um i took a course long ago um pete dawson put it on and he was talking about quality is free and i was trying to do the math i was a new i'd only been out for like six months and he was talking about if you saved a shit ton of money on some la- big lab case, but it ends up looking like shit or breaking and you have to replace it, it costs you way more uh, to do, to redo than if you would have just done it right the first time. So if you're we're talking about a crown, the lab fee is 50 bucks difference between one lab versus another. But if you never have to remake because the more expensive lab saves you that kind of heartache and, and things, pay the damn fee. Yep. You'll have peace of mind. You'll know they're, they've got your back. It's going to go well. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, this, this, this question I thought was actually really, really good. And I thought you'd be the perfect person to be uh, bringing it on. Um, this person, this is from Dentaltown. Oh, am I supposed to? I'm going to bleep that out. I'm not spo- sure I'm supposed to say where I got it. Mm, okay. Uh, student loan planner uh, is, I guess, their handle. Um, He says, we discovered today that NYU Dental School, your alma mater, uh, is now the first dental school in America where the projected cost of attendance for a DDS degree is over $700,000. 
A couple years ago, we projected the total cost for the class of 2022 would be around $650,000. The projected cost for the class of 2024 is now $705,977, according to our calculations. Supposedly, NYU had 3,400 applications for only 375 seats last year. People keep saying they think people will stop applying, but there's really no end in sight right now on the cost of a dental school education. Pretty wild. And then there's this chart here talking about freshman year education expense of 99562 living expense of 40000 loan fees of 4100 and accrued interest at graduation of 34500 and then each year, the tuition is about the same, living expense about the same. The only real difference is the accrued interest uh, that would be lower because of fewer years, but it comes to 705. Um, and then uh, the best cashback bonuses for refinancing dental student loans, 10 year under 4%, 20 year under 5% fixed right now. And this is from uh, Travis Hornsby. Um, the living expense it was. Is that a good or a normal, a, a correct number? Forty thousand dollars. You you lived in Manhattan. Was 40- hell no? Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> That's why. Uh, so when I graduated NYU, I had about five hundred fifty thousand dollars of debt, uh-huh. but I had to take an extra one hundred thirty thousand dollars of supplemental loans just to afford to live in Manhattan. Really? And I mean, you you. No, you didn't see the first place I lived at. I mean, I lived at no. uh, down in Washington Square Park. We I, walked I took by. You by there. Yeah, we walked by, but it was out from outside. We didn't actually go inside. And I, I lucked out that I found this place. Uh, I was paying seven seventy five a month. Whoa! And it was it was dinky. It was one of Edgar Allan Poe's original homes, but <laughs> it, it had never been touched. I don't think is since that where he wrote the there. Raven. Uh, actually, it, the first public reading of the Raven really was there. Yeah. Oh wow. Um, but I had just enough room for – I had a, a dresser, a bookcase, a desk, and then a bunk bed that went over the desk. And then a teeny oh, closet. Okay. And I had four roommates. Pretty mm-hmm. big, uh, spacious living room. And we had this racist, horrible uh, landlady. <laughs> and we all just put up with her shit because we we were able to, to have just such good rent. Well, uh, the so I was there for the first two years. The second two years, I was closer to the dental school, and I was paying 1600 a month uh, for a one-bedroom, and that you did see. Mm-hmm. And everybody from New York, would, would everybody would come over and say, I can't believe you got such a big place for such a good deal. And anybody not from New York would be like, I can't believe you're overpaying for this shithole. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I saw when I, when I came the first time. And I'm like, oh, my God, what a, what a shithole. Or do the rats share the bed with you, or is that – I mean, Which there was a huge mouse problem when I moved in. <laughs> and, and wasn't your uh, kitchen the, really the hallway from the living yep. room? Yeah. It it was a refrigerator, and then there was a stove and a sink. And it was in the hallway uh-huh. on the way to the bedroom and the, the bathroom, just like you said. It had to get a, a butcher block that you'd put around the corner if you're ever cooking anything. Did you um, have to do your di- were your dishes in the shower? Is that how you clean the t- dishes? Or You know, sometimes I would uh, I would do that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, just that way, you know, kill two birds with one stone. Uh-huh. There you go. And then all you do is just open the door, put the dish right around the corner from where the door's open from the shower. <laughs> so you're good to go. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, to, to live in New York, it's it's absolutely ridiculous. In fact, I was just uh, not too long ago looking at what it would be for a studio apartment back down in the village uh-huh. and rent was 12000 a month. So someone's oh paying 144000 a year for a studio. Now, can you get places lower than that? Sure. But it, I mean, it is as expensive as hell to be in yeah. Manhattan, and so so much of of what you need to take out it just is eaten up and, and living expenses, getting around town. Now, did um, a lot of uh, students live in Manhattan, or were a lot of them bridge and tunnel? There were some bridge and tunnel. Um, some people that if they had family that were in the boroughs, maybe they still lived there and they would commute. Um, Russ Morrow, you know, uh-huh. his his dad was a. Mormon mission president at Long Island. So you live oh. there and then commuted in. Um, other people had had roommates. Um, but yeah, people, any way you could try to cut down cost, even though it was still through the roof. Mm-hmm. Um, but it just, it everything in Manhattan so, is just expensive. So this 705 is, is still wrong because people are going to take supplemental loans just for housing. And so... Yeah, there there is no way your living expenses is 40000 a year. There's just, there's no way. Holy shit. That's just and 
Amazing. I believe so. You know the other Clinton Timmerman, uh-huh. uh huh, who I've become friends with. He is a Roman University, so he's down in Jersey, a little bit closer to Philadelphia. Okay, but I want to say he said after his first year of medical school, he was already two hundred sixty thousand in debt. Really, that's crazy. And oh, it is, it, and I think that's the reason why. And I don't know if NYU is still doing this, but the NYU Med School a few years ago they decided they were going to not charge that entering class any tuition. And I know it was just that first year, all four years, because what happens is when you go through all those years of schooling, all that debt, you can't even afford to be a, a primary care physician because you're making $120,000, $180,000 a year with such high debt. And so then people would feel like they're forced to, to specialize. specialize. Okay. And so they were trying to at least make it a little bit not as burdensome. So people, if they wanted primary care, they could do that. Now, did you, when you were considering going to dental school, did you even look at how much your debt was going to be? Or did you just assume whatever it is, I'll, I'll be able to afford it because I'll be a dentist. That's a hundred percent it. I figured, oh, right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I actually, I was an idiot for, well, many reasons. Yeah. Why I'm an idiot. I can tell you, I, I got, I, kept my I have a list. State residence. <laughs> I bet you keep it too, huh? For a little black book uh -huh. of just how Clint's an idiot. Uh -huh. um, no, I, I should not have kept my residency at Washington uh -huh. because at uh, the time I was applying, uh, there were 50 spots, but it's divided amongst five states. Uh -huh. And so they, they have reserved, I think, like 10 for Wyoming, a certain amount for Idaho. And the year I applied, this would have been 2002 because uh -huh. um, it started 2003. I think they had... 4,000 applicants for those 50 spots. Well, had I switched my residency, um, you know, even Utah had, they didn't have a dental school at Utah at the time. That would have probably opened some doors. Um, I, I know even, uh, you know, Megan, the starter wife, she had the same aspirations of going to medical school at University of Washington. And she regrets not switching her residency to New York because then there were, I think, 10 med schools to, to choose from or so. Um, so I might, I had really wanted to go to university of Washington for dental school. Um, people that were better applicants than me got in. Yeah. So then I, I knew I was probably going to go private or even if I'd gotten into a, a state school, I'd be paying at a state tuition, but you're absolutely right. I figured, Hey, my earning potential, I'm, I'll be able to afford it. I'll be a dentist. Yeah. Not realizing the amount of debt I was going to have to take to have a practice or for anything else in life. Um, and I think part of the reason why they charge a lot of this too is also figuring other people's earning potential or the mentality of the entering students thinking they're going to be able to get out there and just rock and roll because they'll be, yeah. you know, quote unquote, a rich dentist. Yeah. I'll admit I didn't even consider my debt load as much of a factor. Um, every school that I was looking at really the out of state tuition versus in state really wasn't that significant. And, mm -hmm. and I won't tell you how little my student loan debt was, um, cause <laughs> it's so much less than yours. Um, but even when I graduated, I thought I was pissed how, how big it was. I didn't really realize how big it could really get. So are you a big fan of this movement out there where everybody's saying, oh, just, we're going to wipe out student debt? Well, <laughs> the funny thing is, is so little, my student debt is government loans uh -huh. anyway. So, but Hey, anything's better than, you know, uh, <laughs> if so, if somehow that that was to go away, I guess it's better than nothing. But then I do have a, a dilemma in that nobody forced me to go to dental school. Uh -huh. Nobody put a gun to my head and said he had to do this. So I knew the debt that I was taking on. Yep. Um, and so it's the kind of thing. Hey, is that is that fair? Is it fair the people that did pay their debts back, or what about the person that paid their loans off a few years ago? Uh -huh. And then was like, well, shit, I should have just waited. <laughs> yeah. And this would have exactly. Then this would have been wiped clean. Um, I, I would definitely would be in favor of, um, if they somehow allowed you to at least expense your student loan debt from your pre-tax money, yeah, something along those lines. Cause you know, I, I'd get snide remarks from, you know, maybe certain family members are like, well, if you didn't travel to that dental conference in Spain, <laughs> you could have paid off your loan. And you're like <laughs> one, yeah. you know, my, my dental conference in Spain wasn't $550,000, yeah. but also that was a legit business expense. But you pay your student loans out of your adjusted gross income. But if they had something where they could a lot like, okay, we well, you know you've paid X amount this year in loan debt, or you can, you can maximize it 
against like your gross revenues. Yeah. Maybe something along like that. But yeah, I think there's got to you know, be some start- sort of middle ground. There, there can't be a, a, a abolition of the debt itself, but uh, maybe give some credit for when we do pay it. Because I, I think those, like you said, the people that have paid their debts or just finished paying their debt, it's not really fair to them that we get right. uh, get to just write it all off. So. And what about in the future? So if we if we all go to zero now, uh-huh. what about the future generation? I mean, the person here that thinks they're going to go to NYU for only seven hundred five thousand, when they're probably going to come out with eight hundred fifty thousand, uh-huh. do we do we wipe this guy's debt too? I mean, it, yeah, it's just tough to know where you would even draw that line. But no, there's a big part that um, I figure. Hey, I took the debt. I mean, right right now, dad is actually the uh, benefactor for my life insurance policy. And I, I told him, oh, really? I was like, hey, you know, if I if I die, it's a two million two million dollar policy. I'm like, I've heard you don't have to pay back the government loans. Like, I guess if I die, that just goes away. But huh. I was like, nope, I'll pay those back too. That's only fair. <laughs> so he tells me, yeah, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> just gotta hope that he dies first. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, well, on that note, we should probably end the show. We that we got three questions in. I'm pretty sure we already lost all listeners anyway. But- uh, probably, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, as is tradition. Oh, I'm wait. Josh is supposed to. He always reads off some things about um, rate and review. What's your favorite number, Clint? Uh, two. Okay, two for Rick Meyer. No, no, no. He, Big fan of five. Uh, Rick Meyer is three. Was he three also? No, wait. Wait, he was two. Or one. He might have been one. Nah, Fuck, no, I don't no. know. He just he sucks. He sucks so bad. <laughs> he was terrible. <laughs> um yeah, we want five stars. People uh give us give us five. If you're not gonna give us five, then just put the mouse down and walk away. Um uh find us on uh, all the social bullshits. Social bullshits. Uh Instagram, Spotify. Social bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Yada, yada, yada. So, Clint, tell me, what's your, what song are we going to finish this with? Well, at first, I was going to go with uh, somebody that I I didn't even think I was a fan of this guy. Uh, but The Weeknd. Not oh, sure yeah. I'm not sure if you've heard his I, latest song, The Blinding Lights. I like, I like The Weeknd, yeah. Yeah, good stuff, good stuff. Um, Is there a reason? Then, why why did you no, like that I just, song? I, I just heard it and it's really catchy okay. and it gets going through my head. Okay. So it's not like it speaks to you in a certain level and it, deep down the, the meaning is. No, okay. nothing like that at all. Sweet. But then I thought. Um, Fuck that. Have you. Yeah. <laughs> I just like we'll do something because I'm sure right now that's probably like in the top top 10 oh, as it? far okay. as songs that are out there. Uh, but Lance, have you. I know you watched Game of Thrones. Uh huh. And then did you watch Westworld at all? I did. Until you it burned did? down. Okay. Yeah. And to, you know what's interesting too is no. it burned down, but then in season two, they were able to, and it followed the storyline, go back to where the set burned down. Oh, and actually use that for what they needed needed to do. Oh, um, but there is a composer by the name of Ramin Jawadi, huh. and he is the one that he'll take a lot of of people's favorite songs, be it if it's Black Hole Sun from Soundgarden. Uh-huh. He's also done some Rolling Stones, um, and then even in season two of Westworld, he did a cover of a Wu-Tang song, hmm. but uh, he also, for Westworld, did a cover of Kanye West. Gold Digger? And What's that? Gold Digger? Close. Okay. No, actually, he did, um, no, but he did a cover of Kanye West's song, Runaway. Okay. Featuring Pusha T, and it's all just piano-based. Okay. There, there are no lyrics to it. Um, and even the Kanye song, Runaway, is pretty cool. But, uh, yeah, Ramin Jawadi, he, the guy is just amazing. Uh, did the score, like I said, for Game of Thrones. And so mm-hmm. pretty much everything he does is, is gold. So I thought tonight, rather than The weekend, Blinding Lights, great song. Check it out. But we'll go with his cover of Runaway featuring Pusha T. Awesome. Awesome. Well, for Clinton Timmerman, I am Lance Timmerman. Peace. Stay fresh, cheese bags. <laughs>